blue region. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a Merry Christmas, season's greetings, and a very warm welcome on this early winter evening to the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada plaque unveiling ceremony commemorating perhaps Canada's most successful team ever in organized competitive sports, the Preston Rivulets women's hockey team. I'd like to begin, as I always do, by acknowledging that the land on which we gather tonight is the traditional territory of the Mohawk, Ojibwe, and the Métis peoples. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing this evening, I would suggest to you, is very important to us as Canadians, when we think about it, to us as a people. Our own history and how we remember our past is important because it helps define the way we think of ourselves as a society. The straight fact is that history is to the nation as memory is to the individual. It gives meaning and context and identity. Without it, we simply can't know ourselves, but using it as a common foundation, we can hope together to build a future bright with promise and possibility. And this evening, we recognize the Preston Rivulets, a women's hockey team that amassed a record of competitive success unmatched in the nine decades since their founding. A team that broke new ground in promoting women's team sports in Canada and that helped pave the way for women's participation in all sports that has led to Canada's recent success in the Winter Olympic Games. And it is now my great pleasure to call to the podium representing the Government of Canada and the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change and Minister Responsible for Parks Canada, the Honourable Catherine McKenna, the Member of Parliament for Cambridge, Mr. Brian May. Brian. Special guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here on, uh, with all of you on behalf of Catherine McKenna, Minister of Environment and Climate Change and Minister Responsible for Parks Canada. Today, we officially welcome the Preston Rivulets women's hockey team to our country's family of commemorated places, persons and events of national historic significance. On behalf of the Government of Canada and following the recommendation of the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, I am very proud to present this plaque as a symbol of recognition and celebration of Canadian heritage. We could not have asked for a better evening to celebrate the legacy of the Preston Rivulets um, than an alumni night that will showcase the Rivulets facing off against the Oakville Hornets. Uh, the Rivulets were a truly unique team led by uh, Hilda Ranscombe, a dynamic right winger. Uh, they skated away with more provincial, regional, and national championships than any other team between 1931 and 1940. They won the Ontario title and the Canadian championship in all the years it was played until the team disbanded in 1941. The birth of the Rivulets came at a time in history that some have dubbed the golden age of women's sport. The interwar years saw a rise in women playing new sports and enhancing the level of competition and organization in existing ones. New teams and leagues were formed at universities by individual women at the community level and by large employers of women who formed teams for their employees. In the summer of 1931, in the small town of Preston, several teenage girls from the Preston Rivulet softball team were looking for a sport to play in the winter. Having skated and played pickup hockey on the Grand River and local ponds since childhood, two sets of sisters, Hilda and Nellie Ranscombe and Marm and Helen Schmuck, formed the Preston Rivulets hockey team. The Rivulets became known for their exciting brand of hockey, and the town of Preston took great pride in the achievements of their winning team. They played a fast, aggressive style of hockey that attracted large audiences and loyal followers to their games. In 1936, the Rivulets drew 6,000 fans to the Galt area for their two-game playoff for the national title against Winnipeg, with one game drawing a record crowd of 3,126 fans. 
Attending a Rivulets game was the thing to do. Games were often festive occasions featuring brands of bands and boisterous crowds cheering on their hometown heroes. For the unlucky fans who could not attend games, Preston's local radio station, CKPC, broadcast them for the enjoyment of fans at home. They were a beacon of happiness for many families during the difficult years of economic recession in Canada. Hilda Ranscombe, who I here may have coached one of our counselors here, was particularly outstanding. Sorry, it didn't rub off. Born in two, 1917, <laughs> she loved to play hockey on the, on the Grand and Speed Rivers. She would skate for hours, practicing her stick handling and shooting the puck. She became one of the fastest skaters, fastest skating and hardest shooting female hockey players in the country, known also for her back checking and deft stick handling and rink long rushes. Carl Linscombe, who played for the Detroit Red Wings from 1937 to 1946, recalled that he played with, with and against Hilda and her sister Nellie on the Grand River. He said, Hilda was just as good as any boy and better than most, myself included. When we picked teams, she was always the first one chosen. Mary McGuire from the 1938 Stratford Aces noted that on one occasion, Ranscombe scored a goal on Terry Sachuk. By drawing him out of the net during a practice at the Galt Arena, she brought the crowd to its feet. Ranscombe, Ranscombe was twice a finalist for Canadian, Canadian, Canada's Athlete of the Year and was regarded by many as the best female hockey player to play the game. Today, the Preston Rivulets legacy serves as inspiration for all who work hard to be the best and to promote opportunities for women. They are hockey legends that push the boundaries of women's sport and inspire generations of women to play the wonderful game of hockey. Thank you very much, everybody. Really, when I started to learn about this team a few years ago, uh, uh, and then when we got the nomination from Carly, um, it became evident that this really was a story that deserved national recognition. I mean, it's impossible to think that a team could have won the hundreds of games with very few losses, very, very few single digits during many, many uh, years put together. Uh, a, a kind of record that would be unthought of today. But they really pioneered uh, women's competitive sports in a certain way in Canada and helped, as I said earlier, uh, lay the foundation really for the kind of success that we're all hoping for in the upcoming Winter Olympics. Now, uh, we have heard from uh, Brian, and I'd now like to call on His Worship Mayor Doug Craig to bring greetings from the city of Cambridge. Mayor Craig. Well, thank you very much. I thought we were going to be at center ice doing this, but it's good to be in here in a rather warmer place. I, you know, I just want to say, you know, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and to, and to reflect back on the history of a great community that has such, such great uh, athletes and wonderful teams that we are now uh, tonight uh, celebrating. You know, when you think of women's sports, how far we've come, and you've heard, uh, uh, you know, Brian talk about uh, the... Uh, the, 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 the history of the Rivulets and what they did, and it was remarkable. And I think now as we reflect on women's sports, and I'm gonna talk about one particular game that took place at the Olympics, and that was the women's gold tournament, hockey tournament. And that's where they were down two goals with three and a half minutes to go. And they tied the game, went into overtime, and they won the gold medal. It's one of the greatest games ever played. And I think we have to reflect on that because it wasn't just about skill. It was about belief in self, belief in their team, belief in country, and dedication to what they believed they could achieve together. And I've, I've watched that at least five or six times because it was such a great game. And that's part of who we are as a, a, a Canadian culture, who we are locally in terms of the, of the women that we uh, want to reflect on and celebrate. Tonight is a great night for everybody. 
When you look across Cambridge in particular, when we have our award ceremonies and we have our Hall of Fame, we have great athletes in every sport doing great things nationally, provincially, nationally, internationally recognized. And we're really proud of that. And I'm proud to be here tonight to reflect on the history of the rivulets, what they've done, and to, to be part of the celebration. And it's a great celebration for all of us. Thank you very much. Next, to help us put what we're doing tonight in its appropriate historical context, we're delighted to have with us the proponent of this nomination of the rivulets, Dr. Carly Adams of the University of Lethbridge. She is the one who did the work to bring the nomination forward and should be recognized for that. And we're very delighted that she can be with us this afternoon, this evening rather, and uh, speak to us about one of her favorite topics, the rivulets. Carly. Good evening, everyone. I'm shaking. I'm so excited to be here tonight. I can't believe this is actually happening after so many years. And I'm delighted that I'm able to be here to celebrate with all of you. This really is a very exciting moment in uh, the history of Canadian hockey. I suppose I initiated this by submitting the nomination package for consideration many, many years ago. I've been fascinated with this team for over 20 years now. In 1997, I was sitting in my first year of university in a class, a sports history class. I suppose I my age by saying that, but that's all right. I was sitting in a sports history class at the University of Windsor, and in our course text, there was one little line about this team, this women's hockey team called the Preston Rivulets, and that was it, one line, and about how remarkable they were. And I immediately thought, who are these women? I was so interested, and within days, I was also incredibly frustrated because I couldn't find any other information. There was nothing out there. And I was curious, how did this remarkable women's team get only one line in a chapter on hockey? I wanted to know more. Who were these women? How did they accomplish so much? Where were the other women who had played hockey? Since that first history class, I was hooked. I wanted to know more about women athletes of the past and why they seem to be absent from the stories that we tell about our sporting past in Canada. I have since dedicated my career as a university professor to researching, writing, and teaching about women's sport experiences and the stories that are so often silenced behind some of the more dominant narratives of hockey in Canada. And you can see how important this story is through the words that we've already heard tonight. Described as the greatest team in Canada and the queens of the ice, the Preston Rivulets were the most successful women's team in the history of women's hockey. For 10 seasons, they dominated women's hockey throughout the province, throughout Eastern Canada, and across Canada. The team won their first Dominion Championship in 1935 by defeating the Winnipeg Eatons. Reporting on the championship games, journalist Alexandrine Gibb at the time wrote, quote, nearly 2,000 wildly enthusiastic fans witnessed 60 minutes of premier hockey as the rival female pucksters spurred on by the glamour of the occasion and the desire to be the possessors of the Lady Bessborough Trophy, emblematic of the Dominion Honours, displayed the greatest exhibition of ladies hockey ever witnessed in this district. When you read the newspapers from the 1930s, especially your local newspapers, they are riddled with accounts of fabulous women hockey games. You should read them. I, I encourage you <laughs> to read them. The Rivulets played fast, aggressive, skillful hockey, and they pushed the boundaries of women's sport during this area, era. And they regularly, we heard an account of um, a championship game where they drew over 3,000 people to the arena. When you read the accounts, they did this regularly, drawing thousands of people to the arena to watch these games. I'm sure many of you know Hilda Ranscombe was the captain of the Rivulets and the star player of the team, and she has been referred to as the Bobby Orr, the Wayne Gretzky of women's hockey. She was an incredibly gifted hockey player who won the praise of sports writers and hockey experts across the country. Many years ago, I had the opportunity to spend some time with Ruth Collins, or Ruth Dargell. Ruth was born in 1923, one of the youngest players on the team in the 1930s, and she played on what was affectionately, affectionately known in the press as the kid line. 
During the time I spent with Ruth, she recounted her relationship with teammates. She regaled me with memories of game moments and stories from a seven-day trip that they took to Prince Edward Island in 1939. For years later, I would often get little notes from Ruth or the odd phone call, and she would call especially when she was watching Haley Wickenheiser play. And she would say to me, Carly, Hilda Ranscombe was a much better player, and she would outskate Haley Wickenheiser any day. She wanted me to know that there was no comparison. It's an incredibly important opportunity to acknowledge the Preston Rivulets, and I'm so grateful that you're all here. It's important that we honor their legacy as the most accomplished women's team in Canada's history, and I'm so delighted that they've been chosen by the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada to be commemorated and recognized by the Canadian government in this way. I look forward to celebrating with you this evening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ian Taylor, Director of Hockey Development at Ontario Minor Hockey. Today we're going to talk about speed with the puck. The most important thing to remember is to eliminate unnecessary stick handling and underhandle the puck. This is an open ice or breakaway technique where the player pushes the puck with one hand in order to skate at full speed. The puck should be out in front of the body and off to the side. Push the puck ahead on the backhand with the bottom edge of the stick blade and pushes the puck forward. The hands stay out of the area in front of the hips. Handling is a key skill to maintain speed and allows the player to keep their eyes up and to read the play around them. Check out more Chalk Talk episodes on Rogers TV and more drills and resources at omha.net. Very good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've heard before from the mayor, but it's true, we're privileged to have with us tonight someone who throughout much of Ontario and Canada needs no introductions, Hazel McCallion, former mayor of Mississauga. Hazel, please come to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. It's so good to be with Dr. Alway. You can't imagine the number of sites that he helped me establish or recognize in the city of Mississauga, a great Canadian, contributing so much to retaining our historic sites and such. So you're doing a great job. Mr. MPP, no, MP, sorry. And of course, Mayor Craig, I've known him for years. It's just, we, we did a good job together, didn't we? Yeah. And then to be with Fran Ryder, the president and CEO of the Ontario Women's Hockey, who in my opinion, put female hockey on the international map. She's the one that, back in 1979, yeah, got me involved in working on international tournaments. I was the honorary president. She used me to get money raised for them, but that's all right. <laughs> and to think that she and I attended the first game of the Olympics in Nagano, Japan. She's the one that did it, believe it or not. She is now in the International Hockey Hall of Fame. Think about it. Was recognized, I went over with her to Prague. And of course, has had many other Order of Canada, which I was so pleased that she received that. So young women, there's a great future for you, a great future. And as I said to you as, I, as we had a picture taken, it's very important that young girls remain in female hockey because we need good teams to beat the United States. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, we got to be there. Well, when the, uh, this famous team was organized in 1931, I was 10 years old, playing hockey on the Gaspy Coast playing hockey on ponds, frozen ponds in hayfields. We didn't even have an arena. But I learned to play hockey on a pond in a farmer's field, in my own farmer's field, because my dad owned a farm. And then I went to Montreal and uh, uh, tried out 
thinking that maybe with the hockey I played, with no proper equipment, that maybe I'd try out. And I, wa I was accepted by the league that existed in Montreal in 1939, 40, and 41. And then they dressed me up with all the equipment, which slowed me down. But I played center. <laughs> and then unfortunately, maybe fortunately, I was transferred to Toronto in 1942, the company I worked for. And unfortunately, it was war work, and therefore I didn't get back to playing hockey. But then I met Fran Ryder. And that's what I'm really enjoying this print. Because in my opinion, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, gentlemen, female hockey is real hockey. <laughs> They're, they don't take their opponent out of the game. They beat them at the game. That's right. And that is what is so important. It is actually, I was surprised. Female hockey has not been given the recognition that it should. You know, you can't imagine, Mr. Mayor, the number of mayors I had to phone on behalf of the WHA to get mayors to make sure that their recreational director assigned time for the girls to play hockey. They allocated ice to the boys, but to the girls, no. I, m I remember phoning the mayor of Hamilton saying, Bob, smarten up. Female hockey is important. Assigns, make sure your recreation director assigns some time. But you know what? We're being recognized now. And I want to thank Parks Canada and especially Dr. Alway. This is a very important night in the history of female hockey in Canada. Think about it. That we're finally being recognized. And as I say, I'm just delighted with the young girls now. I talk to parents. They're very proud that their daughter plays hockey. When I played hockey, it was not popular in 1940 and 41 for a girl to play hockey. But we overcame that, and we have overcome it. So folks, the future is in your hands, the young girls that are now taking up hockey. And our future is to make sure that we have the, the expertise which can be built with the girls having commitment to be the best in the, in the field of hockey. Because quite honestly, we need some good players in our national team in order to win in the Olympics, et cetera. Thank you, Preston. What a wonderful, and thank you, Dr. Finally, it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce to you someone who, in fact, has already been just introduced by Mayor McCallion, uh, Ms. Fran Ryder, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Women's Hockey Association. So, Ms. Ryder, if you would please come forward. And I don't know whether this is a right thing. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's a true honor to be here, and what a special day. The uh, Hockey Canada just announced its Olympic team, uh, the women's Olympic team that's, uh, that's heading off to, uh, to Korea uh, to, uh, to proudly represent this country. And uh, the Preston Rivulets, who really were key players in that movement to get women's hockey into the Olympics, are being recognized uh, today. And certainly, um, when you see the reports and the media that comes out of this evening, um, the students that are are trying to research and find out what uh, what women's hockey players did are going to have an easier time recognizing the uh, the icons on on the uh, the Preston team. Um, special welcome to any any family members of, of the players of that team. In incredible! I had the uh, I had the honor. I started playing in 1967, uh, and that probably will age myself. But uh, um, when I started playing, um, teams were very difficult to find. Other teams were very difficult to find. Ice was almost impossible to find. And uh, we would uh, regularly travel three and a half hours to play a 3.15 minute running time game if we were lucky enough to get a half hour of ice. And, uh, but the fact was the players on our team were enthusiastic and caring, and the players on the other teams were enthusiastic and caring. Uh, great, great players that, uh, that played on those teams. And uh, amazing that 
at, uh, without an infrastructure of support, how good the players actually became and also how, how good they, they were at trying to build a better world for uh, younger people coming up and uh, future players coming up. Uh, players here today, you know, we're looking to you to lead this future. And uh, what happened in women's hockey is, uh, you know, no matter what our infrastructure did, because the Ontario Women's Hockey Association was formed in 1975 officially. It's the only female hockey organization in the world. And because it was a network, an organized network of people working together to grow a game, we were able to have an impact of starting the national championships in 1982, starting the world tournament in 1987, and quite frankly, we were told to stop. We were told there will never be a world championship in your lifetime. There will never be women's hockey in the Olympics. And you looked into the players' eyes of your teammates and the players you played against and thought, you know, they deserve it. And the players will sell it themselves. And once the media came out to see how good the women players were, it did sell itself. It, it did sell itself. So with the, the media the national championship brought, the media the uh, world tournament brought, and also what the other players did in other countries other than Canada, as much as Canadian women had it difficult playing the game of hockey um, in this country, it's incredible what some of the, the women in those other countries have to do to this day to play any sport, let alone the sport of hockey. And uh, right now, there's 38 countries ranked in women's hockey internationally. Uh, we're fortunate to work with a lot of them. We try and encourage them and try and support them. And the self-esteem and the life skills that these people learn in other countries is just amazing. And it's going to lead to a better world. Because what we did in women's hockey, everybody was telling us, no, you can't. They, no, you can't. You can't play. You can't have national competitions. You can't have international competitions. You'll never have Olympic competitions. But the world came together because the players in the other countries had to give a lot of their time and their money, again, with no infrastructure support. But they believed in themselves. They believed in their teammates. They came to the world tournament, their cost. We didn't have a lot of money. We did, Hazel was right. We did get a lot of money from her. And, uh, and actually, we had a lot of credibility from her. So uh, certainly, uh, the strength of Hazel can, can never be un, you know, overstated. It, it's just incredible what she has done. But those players came together and managed to come to Canada to play in 1987, the World Tournament. And it was the media that took this out to uh, people's homes, kitchen tables. Young girls sat at their tables talking with their family, hey, I can do that. This game is for me. And from that moment forward, the movement was had to uh, first world championship in 1990. The International Olympic Committee sent two delegates to the uh, world championship in Finland in 1992. And uh, women's hockey was accepted into an Olympic sport in, uh, in Japan in 1998. We're disappointed it didn't come to Lillehammer, but the contract had been awarded. And uh, the organizers had an option of picking up. They did not, which, which the saddest part of that was some of the leader players in all the countries were a little bit too old to ever play for the Olympics. But they're the ones that got it there. Just like the Preston Rivulets got us where we are today. It, it's that history, and, it, and, it, and it, can't, you know, it can't be forgotten. And thanks so much to Parks Canada, the city, everyone, the, the federal government, everybody who has come together to recognize this team. It's absolutely wonderful that those people are being recognized for what they did. And, uh, and together, we are making a stronger world through sport. And maybe we'll have more peace and strength in this country because of the leadership people learn through playing a game because it's not the score of a game that matters. It's the friendships you make, it's the competition you have, it's the memories you make, and the skills you learn to go on into the, into the business world and a leadership role in the future. So ladies, we're counting on you. You can do it, and uh, there's a lot of challenges ahead, but uh, certainly the hockey is one part of it, and uh, we, we commend you on your getting to this level. Jim Holman, the president of PWHL, welcome to the, the session today, and uh, thanks so much to everybody for coming out on this wonderful, wonderful day. All the best. One, two, three. Right. the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Oh! We can go three weeks without food, three days without water.